All right, so uh, good afternoon. As mentioned, my name is Ryan Armstrong, and I manage an application security testing team uh, at a company called Digital Boundary Group. We are an offensive security consulting firm based out of Canada uh, as well as the US. And today I'm going to be sharing some of the highlights of what I've learned in trying to be an effective manager of a security testing team. Uh, and of course, I'd like to start by thanking my team as well as everyone else at Digital Boundary Group. Obviously, without these folks, there would be no talk today. And here's a team photo, recent team photo. Um, you know, like many testing teams, we are entirely remote. Uh, we've been remote, you know, since pandemic time. And I honestly really wanted to discuss some of the successes and failures and challenges around managing remote teams. Uh, but unfortunately, I really wasn't able to uh, fit in the slides. But if you're interested about this specifically, you know, please just reach out to me or, or talk to me later. So before I get into the core content of the talk, I think it's worthwhile to provide some personal context so you understand where I'm coming from. This is a funny picture that I always include on my slides I won't have time to talk about. So if you're interested in a funny story, also ask me later. Um, so a bit of uh, personal background. So I started as an application security tester, you know, a pen tester, uh, eight years ago at Digital Boundary Group. I've been managing our team for the last three years. Um, and about the same time, I also started teaching uh, application security and developing application security content at a local college. Um, and it's one of the passions of mine. I, I like teaching and training. I uh, love to do it. I'm, uh, I'm very lucky that I get to do it at a college, and I also get to do it on the job when I'm you know, training our, our security specialists. Uh, but my first management experience was actually not in application security. Uh, it was managing a waterfront lifeguarding team. Uh, but management is generally, you know, somewhere across the board. You want to build an effective team to accomplish some goal. And to do so, you want to assure that everyone is proficient, that the team works well together, and that the systems that support the work are optimized for the intended outcomes. So, you know, what's the goal of a lifeguarding program? It's quite simple. You want to reduce the number and the impact of incidents on the beach, right? Uh, and it's a simple goal that theoretically can be measured, but it's very challenging to work backwards from that and create the appropriate training and standards and evaluations and the processes that are realistic and appropriate. You know, how fast should a lifeguard be able to run? How fast should they be able to swim? How can we effectively simulate incidents to train for? How do you provide effective feedback and incentivize the right personal development that aligns with the goals of the team? So these are all challenging questions of individual performance that are worth thinking through. But it's important also to think about utilizing the systems you control to impact your outcome. So for example, at beaches, you've probably seen flags that are different colors, right? We use a system of colored flags to indicate the level of hazard in the water. The idea is you see the red flag, you probably shouldn't swim, right? It's used to dissuade people from swimming. It's a system that we have uh, control over. And so the ideal rescue is actually one, is, you know, it's not one that's performed by the fittest or fastest lifeguard. It's the rescue situation that you prevent with a good system. Um, like many people in the field, uh, I assume, and probably a lot of people here, I didn't have formal education in cybersecurity. There still are not a lot of programs for that, especially for application security. Um, <clears throat> so prior to entering the field, I completed my uh, PhD in biomedical engineering, where I worked on surgical simulators. So essentially, you know, like video games for surgeons to both uh, train them on their technical skills and also to evaluate those technical skills. Um, and honestly, I actually didn't have a great time in grad school. I kind of had a bad time, and I wouldn't recommend it to a lot of people. But it was a really formative experience. Um, and uh, I had a really high level of autonomy, which was great for pursuing topics that interested me. <clears throat> but I also had very little mentorship or feedback, uh, and I largely worked alone. And I actually think like this quite significantly impeded my development as a researcher. And I do consider myself very knowledgeable when it comes to research methodology and you know the scientific method. But I honestly think I learned more outside of my PhD than inside it. Um, so uh, you know, around the time when I was finishing my PhD, I actually developed uh, a, a really strong passion for uh, kind of science. Uh, advocacy and activism, and for uh, a brief time, I actually ran uh, a nonprofit organization in Canada dedicated to this. Um, I was motivated to do this when I came across advertisements for a local health practitioner in my town who was basically selling fraudulent treatments for cancer. Um, <clears throat> and so that's the kind of stuff that I went after. And, you know, I made some impact in it, but ultimately, I couldn't affect systemic change. Private healthcare practitioners are incentivized to sell and upsell their services. And in Canada, they regulate themselves. So there's really no incentive in the system for them to pursue rigorous scientific standards and requirements. They're just trying to make money. Um, and so I mentioned these experiences because they were formative in some of the, 
you know, lessons that I learned and how I apply these to management. And that's what I wanted to start out with. And I think, you know, uh, the, the most obvious one from, uh, from a lot of my experience is that, you know, connecting human performance with outcomes is uh, a very difficult thing to do. Um, and when we're talking about security testing, you know, there's a very big and complex gap between the outcome of security testing efforts and the actual outcome you're trying to achieve with a security program, which is not have security incidents or like breaches, right? Um, secondarily, of course, Strong mentorship and feedback are really important. And I think it's not just important for professional development, but it's important for well-being as, as well. Like when you get valuable feedback, you're able to improve, you, you're able to understand where you are and how you're doing. I think it's very, very important for your well-being in really any professional field. And I think our industry probably does a very poor job at giving valuable feedback. Uh, and I think, you know, it's largely because we don't have proven methods for assessing uh, the performance of security testers. Uh, you know, and I, I don't exclude myself <laughs> when I'm talking about our industry. Um, whoop. Systems incentive, system incentives drive behavior and ultimately outcomes. And I would even go further than this and say that, you know, based on my experience, system incentives also drive people's beliefs, right? People's beliefs change in response to the incentives they have. There's uh, an old saying by Upton Sinclair that roughly goes, it's difficult to get someone to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. And I've seen that be the case, you know, uh, again and again. Um, and unfortunately, entrenched systems are very difficult to change, or at least the way to do so is, is not very obvious. And it, it's very easy to spend a significant amount of time fighting the symptoms of a system without causing meaningful change. And I have to admit, there were lots of times in my life where I've done this, you know, uh, and it, it feels like you're doing what you should be doing, but you're not making any practical uh, progress. And these are some of the lessons that, you know, I bring with me into management. Um, <clears throat> and so now I'm going to talk about my management principles to kind of further set the stage for this talk. Um, first one, under the right conditions, I think anyone is capable of being an effective security tester. I think there's been a lot of emphasis on finding the right talent, right? Finding the, the self-starters who are uh, just kind of natural born, you know, security testers. And uh, I think that does a real disservice to the industry. And, um, you know, I, I think part of the problem is we don't have formalized mechanisms to get people in, you know, into these opportunities. We don't have opportunities for people. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying there aren't highly talented people, but uh, there's, there's definitely a lack of guiding people, again, to those opportunities. And my approach for finding the right people is finding people whose goals align with my own. And my goal is to have a team of security testers who are experts. So I want to find people who are passionate and want to become experts. And that's like perfect alignment, right? Um, and uh, individuals and teams also are crucial stakeholders in, in the work. And, you know, what I mean by this is that if you want people to be dedicated and interested in their work, it must be their work, right, to some degree. When it comes to team decisions, I think collective decision-making uh, is, is very important, not just as an equitable approach, but one that can also result in really optimal solutions. Uh, transparency, I think, is... Uh, is undersold. It's, you know, it's not just a good way to build trust with the team, but it's really, really helpful and necessary for teams, for effective teams to be empowered to make better contextual decisions. Um, <clears throat> effective teams, of course, require ongoing uh, training and feedback. I, I keep drilling this, and I, I, I will continue to as the talk goes on. Um, and, and finally, I think that management should be engineering-oriented, and that's how I approach management, not as just managing you know, a set of isolated individuals, and we're, we're trying to optimize individually their performance, but looking at it at a systems level and understanding what are the systems at play that are influencing the performance of the team. How do we optimize their performance? How do we make it easier for them? How do we uh, you know, reduce the opportunities for error in the processes? Um, uh, but management principles aren't enough. So, you know, when I started my role, I searched for resources on managing security teams, but I really only found resources for development teams, and they've got a lot of them, right? They got books and podcasts and conferences and so on for how to effectively manage development teams and engineering teams and so on. And there are some good insights in there. I've read quite a bit of this material, but like security testing is structurally different from uh, from development. Like, it's not the same. They're significantly different. And so I, there's actually a lot that I, I think doesn't really apply. And that's the case as well with, with metrics, right? There's been a lot of effort into establishing uh, really usable metrics in the developer space for productivity and performance. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of research and, and debate about these. Uh, and we don't have the uh, equivalent for security testers, really, I would say. Um, there are, you know, and again, these are for developers. They don't apply to security testers. There nevertheless are some useful, like, insights from some of these. I'm not going to dive into the, the details for all of those. So that brings me finally to the motivation for this talk. 
there's a lack of high quality, and I would kind of also say there's kind of a lack of medium and low quality resources for how to build effective application security testing teams. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I'm not here to say that I have all the answers. I'm not even going to say that I necessarily do a great job, but uh, I try to take an empirical approach to it, and I think that that's the best method to iterate towards effective practices. So, what makes an effective application security or penetration testing team? What's the answer? And I would say it depends. If you're a consultancy, an effective team is one that's profitable. It's one that makes money, right? <laughs> and if you're an internal team, it's one that justifies its own existence. Because those are the incentives, those are the things that allow those teams to keep doing their work. Um, but um, a, a kind of more... Um, uh, a, a more broad answer or, or, or looking deeper at, at least at the market of consultancies is that, you know, there, there are different types of, uh, consultancies that can be effective and can be profitable in the market. Um, and, um, one example of these, I'd, I'd like to break these down into a, a simplified, uh, taxonomy. Uh, everyone's probably familiar roughly with the distinction between the two. Um, you know, the, the nature of the market permits for a spectrum of consultancies, but generally I categorize, uh, categorize these into the so-called, you know, boutique security firm. This is a firm that they try to make experts of the security team. They are interested and passionate about security. They try to do in-depth testing and deliver valuable, uh, you know, reports that are accurate to their clients. Uh, and then there's, you know, the so-called pen test puppy mill. And I won't be going into the details uh, behind these. It's been, you know, a widely kind of talked about uh, issue, if you will. But uh, some people kind of refer to this as some aberration in the field and in, in the market. And it's not really, right? It's, uh, it's still fulfilling a market need because we exist in a market that doesn't necessarily favor the boutique security firm in all cases, right? You have organizations who simply do need to check that box. And if you look at a lot of compliance and regulatory standards, in order to check that box, all they need to do is get something that's called a pen test. And it doesn't really matter what that thing is called. So um, that's the market as I see it roughly for um, security testing consultancies. But mostly for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on the boutique security firm, which is, you know, I like to think our company <laughs> falls within this category as opposed to the, the pen test puppy mill. Um, Realistically, if you were look to, to look at the spectrum of companies that exist in the market, uh, there probably is a spectrum. And so if we were to graph what I would call the performance or the quality of assessments against the productivity or, or quantity, right, how fast you're churning out um, reports and engagements, uh, probably all, uh, you know, organizations fall roughly in some arrangement like this in a scatter plot. Obviously, this is completely made up data. This isn't real data, right? It's for the purposes of this example. Um, and I think, you know, regardless of where you fall on this graph, your goal should ultimately be to optimize in both directions. That makes sense from a business point of view. You want to provide higher quality engagements, and you also ideally like to be able to do them faster or uh, with less effort. Now, um, I'm actually not going to focus too much on the productivity part of it, and the reason is I believe that when you train people to be effective security testers, when you train them to, you know, understand what they're doing, uh, dig deep for findings, um, perform well on engagements, that the productivity will follow. They'll become more efficient as they gain expertise. So, uh, I really do like to focus on the quality aspect rather than the productivity aspect, but sometimes they're quite related, right? So uh, let's expand on the current state of uh, security testing teams, uh, or at least as I see it, right? So the big caveat here is that uh, this list is based on my own experience rather than hard evidence, which is kind of ironic given the nature of this talk. Uh, but I think you will find these claims, or at least some of them, roughly self-evident. Um, there's an overemphasis in the field on individual performance, right? Um, everything is so, like... <laughs> It's so geared towards the individual rather than security testing teams. You see this in, you know, kind of formal security testing, penetration testing, as well as bug bounty. Um, there's no standardized training or credentials, really. There's kind of a, a wide uh, array of uh, certificates that are available that you can get. They don't follow a standardized curriculum. They're pretty much all missing one thing or another uh, with respect to what I would consider a complete or comprehensive training program. Uh, there's a real lack of evidence behind performance, productivity, training, and so on. Uh, our field receives a lot less attention than development or, you know, many other uh, high-performance fields. Uh, there's unfortunately a lack of regulation and industry adherence to standards, right? So OWASP has a lot of great standards, but in a lot of situations, the market does not demand OWASP standards, right? And uh, that impacts how security teams develop. Uh, and finally, there's there's really limited use 
uh, if any, of, of empirical methods, right? We, uh, we seemingly rarely ask and answer important questions about the work that we do. Um, and, you know, in fairness, our field is quite young compared to a lot of more mature professions. And one of those professions that I'm going to talk about today is surgery. And so if you look at surgery, I mean, this is way back, right? <laughs> but, uh, and this is also a painting. But uh, if you look at surgery, you know, 100 plus years ago, it kind of looks similar to the state of security testing today. And that is, there's kind of no formal education. Training is largely through apprenticeship. There's no licensing or professionalization. There's no standardization. The field is not evidence-based. Um, and once, you know, even once um, surgical schools started to pop up, or at least this was the case in, in North America, the quality varied wildly. And there were like surgeon puppy mill schools that would basically just graduate anyone. It became so bad that you can read accounts of surgical schools that removed written tests because they were graduating surgeons who were illiterate. Obviously, a lot has changed, right? <laughs> so much has changed. Uh, and um, Surgery Now is a great example of the professionalization um, of a specific, you know, highly technical and, and high-risk uh, industry or, or field. Uh, education is largely standardized. You know, it does vary region to region around the globe. Um, a lot of uh, surgery now includes validated procedures and training. Uh, there's a culture of safety and ongoing improvement. Uh, it's strictly regulated, and uh, especially the training um, and this last one, you know, there's even standardized entrance requirements to actually get into medicine. And I mentioned this last one, not because I think it's necessarily good, but just for some perspective. You know, in North America and some other countries, if you want to even go to medical school, before you can even specialize as a surgeon, you have to write an entrance exam. Uh, it's called the MCAT. And, like, I've, I'm familiar with the content of this exam. It's harder than probably the vast majority of, like, cybersecurity certifications. <laughs> That's to get into medical school, right? So, again... Not saying that it's necessarily good, but there's a, there's a level of formalized education path that it, it, you know it, we're not even close to. Okay, so what I really want to talk about though is the technical skills assessment of uh, actual surgeons, and it turns out they've developed an assessment called the Objective Structured Assessment of Technical Skills. So uh, this test utilizes an observer to watch either a simulated exercise um, or a full procedure in the operating room. And they grade the procedure according to a specific checklist, as well as a global rating scale for proficiency. So what that looks like is, for a given procedure, there's a checklist that asks all of the relevant questions of the procedure, right? Did they do this step of the procedure? How well did they do it? Did they do this step? Did they do this? And, and so on. That's specific to the procedure. And then they also have a global rating scale that provides the observer the opportunity to score skills not specifically related to the procedure. So, for example, you know, were the instruments handled well? How was the, the flow of the operation? Um, how were the movements? How was the timing of everything? Um, and a question that might be asked in more prof uh, mature professions than ours is, is this assessment tool actually valid? That is to say, how well does this assessment actually assess what we're interested in, right? If someone, if an observer is scoring a trainee who's conducting these exercises, does the score accurately reflect that subject's skills? And as it turns out, this is not an easy question to answer. But, you know, there are actually many different types of um, ways to assess validity that we can borrow from psychology research. Uh, and so by evaluating an assessment tool in this way, we can begin to establish evidence that the tool actually measures what it purports to measure. And this, of course, is exactly what the surgical profession has done with the OSATs. Um, so this is one of the early studies looking at um, the OSATs out of the University of Toronto. And, you know, many have been conducted since. And the profession continues to refine best practices around training and technical skills uh, evaluation, and they do it in an empirical approach by looking at all the ways in which they can validate the assessment is actually measuring what they think it's measuring. Um, so the OSATs is now a crucial tool that's used in surgical curriculums to assess the progress of trainees and provide specific actionable feedback. And in some cases, it's used to effectively, you know, graduate that resident to where they can independently perform uh, procedures, right? Essentially, they're a full surgeon at this point. And uh, the reason why they're, uh, they're so strict about this uh, approach and they have such you know, rigorous standards is because there's a high amount of risk, right? And there's what we call the learning curve effect, where as you're learning how to do a surgery, you're going to make more errors than someone who's proficient at it. And we have that same learning curve effect in security testing. You put a novice on a security test, they're going to miss more things than someone who's an expert. Um, 
And what is also great about this assessment tool is that it's not a mystery to people who take it. There are clear objectives and requirements for specific procedures that must be performed, so the feedback can actually be very targeted too, right? It's a very good system not just to evaluate someone, but to help them determine the areas where they're deficient at and improve. And technical skills are not the only important factor in security testing or in surgery. Um, and so this also is a big issue in, in surgery. Um, there are estimates that communication failures make up to, uh, up to about 25% of errors that lead to, to litigation. And so that's kind of, a, you know, that's not a technical skill. It doesn't relate to how well they're performing the surgery itself. It's about communicating, whether that's in the OR or outside the OR. Um, so naturally, there's an equivalent to the OSATs, uh, an assessment tool for non-technical skills, aptly named the non-technical skills for surgeons or the knots. Uh, similar to the OSATs, this assessment tool requires an observer of a simulated or actual surgery to rate uh, or provide feedback across a number of key categories of non-technical skills. And these categories and elements were chosen based on consensus of experts, right? So they got a bunch of surgeons together and they locked them in the room and, you know, they came up with this, uh, this consensus of, of non-technical skills to evaluate. And unfortunately, we don't have the same level of collaboration in our industry as the surgical profession, right? Um, and, you know, it's great that we have OWASP. OWASP is kind of the pinnacle of that evaluation or of that, sorry, collaboration. Um, and so, nevertheless, just like the OSATs, the NOTS has been subjected to evaluations of validity. Uh, in this particular study, um, a very simple question was asked. Does this assessment distinguish between different levels of experience? So uh, the years that are stated are, are residency years. And in this case, of course, they found that correlation. And now, this isn't, uh, this isn't the end of the validation process. This is just that first piece of evidence. You know, does it succeed in this case or does it fail? Okay, now we'll move on to identify different and, and validate different um, types of uh, validity. It's an important first step. Um, so now that we're on the pathway of thinking about creating and validating skills assessments, it's worth noting that there are important considerations beyond validity of an assessment. Uh, does the assessment provide valuable feedback, for example? Can someone improve with feedback from an assessment uh, that they're given? Um, also, uh, another important one, does the assessment cause unnecessary stress? Um, you know, just because an assessment causes stress, I think doesn't make it inappropriate or unnecessary. Uh, but the question is worth asking. An approach like the OSATs is, I think, very different from existing assessments in our field, because most of them, you know, you don't have like an observer, you know, over your shoulder grading you on something. Um, but uh, the type of approach is not uncommon in other high performance technical fields. Um, and I think that the potential added stress is probably worth the benefit that the assessment or assessments like this can provide in terms of giving useful feedback and evaluating trainees. So spend a lot of time, you know, I've mentioned systems earlier in the talk, and I've spent a lot of time talking more about individuals and individual performance. So let's shift gears a little bit and uh, talk about systems and uh, ways to represent uh, the factors that influence human performance in complex systems. You've probably seen some variation of this diagram before, uh, probably used in some like defense in-depth conceptualization. Um, this is uh, James Reason's Swiss cheese model. There are many variations of the model. Um, this one is popular in medical contexts. So in this model, you have hazards that can result in losses, right? <laughs> Easy enough. And uh, to protect against the hazards, you implement several safeguards, right? Defense in-depth. But losses can still occur when there is the right exploitation of latent and active errors. A latent error is typically described as an attribute of a system that predisposes a person to an error, whereas the active error is an error that, you know, someone makes, right? They've, uh, they've uh, done something that they shouldn't have done, but maybe they were predisposed to that by the design of the system. And there are all kinds of uh, errors that uh, occur in, in surgery and in medicine broadly that we can fit to this model. Um, a, a really common example is the uh, medical error of administering the wrong medication. Uh, one of the systems ideally that should support uh, medication is labeling, right? Having very clear labels indicating what medication to use, but maybe two labels are very system and are very similar and hard to distinguish. Uh, and this would be a latent error, right? So you've got two labels for two different medications. They look very similar. Hey, if you look close, you can distinguish them. But, you know, maybe someone, maybe a physician is in a hurry. They grab the one. They don't validate it. That's the active error that leads to the uh, incorrect uh, application of a medication. Um, and so, uh, yes, there was a human element. There was an active error. The physician should have checked the label. But we can design systems that make it harder to make those mistakes. 
All right. So why are we talking about surgery? I hope it's kind of obvious why we're talking about surgery, but just in case it's not, let's center ourselves again. Um, you know, surgery shares a number of key attributes with security testing. I'm not saying we're on the same footing as surgeons. I'm not saying we're basically surgeons. I'm just saying from a systems perspective, it's a complex technical human task and there's a high risk of, from, from failures, right? In surgery, errors lead to injuries, right? And death. In security testing, uh, if you miss a major vulnerability that ought to have been caught, you know, that can lead to major losses for an organization. Should it be exploited? Should they be breached? And so on. Um, and just as we're doing this talk, there's actually a tradition of high-risk industries learning from one another. Uh, in fact, the surgical profession derived some of its best practices from the aviation industry. Uh, and one example is the use of checklists, for example, to reduce surgical error, right? Using a checklist to make sure that you've followed all of the proper procedures, to make sure that you haven't missed anything, to make sure you're not performing a surgery on the wrong site, which you know used to be a very common uh, issue. It's less common now. Uh, in part because of robust, you know, checklists and error preventing systems. Um, so let's shift our focus now to security testing. And uh, first, I want to look at the, um, the, the the kind of present, as I see it, common path for security testers. So testers typically enter the industry, you know, if they're starting out just applying to a company, probably that company is going to have them complete some CTF-like assessment as part of the interview process, and then maybe a technical interview. And if they're lucky, uh, they receive training through mentorship and apprenticeship. If they're unlucky, they go to a company and they say, go learn on your own, which, you know, it does happen. I've heard of that happening, unfortunately. Um, and uh, eventually, they have to perform their first engagement. So in theory, there should be some sort of evaluation to determine whether their skills, uh, you know, suit them for actually going out and conducting a real engagement against a real application. There should be some type of graduation or certification to the process. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, the gold standard for that, uh, or the, you know, the, the gold standard method is expert observation, right? You have an expert tester who observes a junior tester doing a test. You see how they approach it. You see the mistakes that they make, and you determine whether they're ready for um, for moving on. Uh, and there are a number of challenges with this uh, this approach. And I also, again, I am aware of companies that don't even have that, right? Um, and um, once uh, once you do graduate, though, as a security tester, um, in, in many situations you're kind of on your own, right? As you advance through your career, the kind of the best feedback that uh, I think is generally given comes from technical reviews, right? Typically, companies have a technical review process. You conduct a test, you make the report, you send it through the review process. You have someone uh, who hopefully is an expert going through your review to find inconsistencies, issues, and so on. And uh, it's a pretty good mechanism to learn, but it's not sensitive to certain types of, of issues. Um, and when we're talking about ongoing learning, a lot of it is self-directed, right? You, you study on your own, you do readings, maybe you take the odd certification or uh, uh, or training course, but there's not kind of a there, there, there's no rigorous and standardized professional development. So finally, I'm now going to shift gears from uh, all of the all the setup and all the context, and I'm going to just talk about basically uh, stream of consciousness. Except it's not conscious. I've recorded the slides already. Um, what we have tried and what has been successful, and I, th I think what has been unsuccessful. Uh, and I wanted to begin from the beginning with hiring. So one practice that I think that as an industry we should probably move away from is CTF exercises for hiring. I think these types of assessments are useful only for a very narrow level of experience, like an experienced junior tester. I think that's where they'll shine, and outside of that, there's not much value to them. Um, you know, uh, but you know, e even then we've had uh, candidates in that area who have performed well at a CTF-like exercise. They come into the technical interview, I ask them what I think are basic technical questions, and they don't know them. So. I don't think it's that valuable of an exercise. Um, and the way that I've seen some companies do it, I really don't like. Like the whole take-home exam thing, like, here you go, you've got like a week to complete this. Um, I think it puts uh, a lot of unnecessary burden on the time of candidates who are, who are applying. Um, but uh, there are other issues with this as well. So uh, if you're planning to hire novices uh, who you are going to train, um, you're going to filter out people who might be excellent testers given the right opportunity, right? If you're, uh, if you want to get people who can excel, but, you know, they just haven't, they haven't done security testing yet, right? They don't know how to navigate a CTF, but they might otherwise be really great candidates. I think it's a lot more appropriate to approach this from an aptitude point of view rather than giving something like, hey, do you know, do you know cross-site scripting yet? <laughs> because if you don't, you're out. Um, and secondly, I think this type of assessment is very insensitive to much higher levels of expertise. So when we're looking at senior candidates, I think that the CTF-like challenge 
uh, it, it, it doesn't distinguish between them very well, one. And I also think that it doesn't assess a lot of the skills that we want from our senior uh, candidates who come in as, as testers. So for our senior candidates, we implemented a new approach where we present a very low-quality fake report. You can see a little snippet from it there. It's terrible. And their task is to provide technical feedback as if they're conducting a review for uh, a junior tester's report. So we're testing their technical knowledge, yes, but we're also assessing key skills expected of a senior candidate, like identifying potential gaps and errors in uh, testing from a report and also providing uh, really effective feedback as part of the technical review process. Um, and we've actually hired someone uh, using this approach, and it's been going great. <laughs> All right. Um, On to the training process. So our training processes have also evolved uh, substantially. One thing that is really missing in our field that I keep emphasizing is a comprehensive curriculum, right? What are the things, what are the things that a security tester should know? What are the things that uh, they should train on? How should we evaluate them? And, and so on. Probably the closest, like, comprehensive resource that I can really think of is the old web application hacker's handbook, which was what I was partially trained on. Um, you know, the thing is old, the thing is um, missing a lot of modern content, but uh, it's kind of a, uh, it, it was, it did a great job at, you know, putting a lot of the concepts all together in kind of one resource in a structured way. Um, so we decided to scale our approach, uh, in hiring by bringing on cohorts of, of novice testers. So we hired groups of, of three, for example. And these are people with no prior security testing experience, right? So we put them through more of an aptitude test than a specific CTF type challenge. And um, how we approach training is by delivering it as a class. And so the first effort towards um, this program involved construction of a curriculum. And uh, this was just my first attempt at kind of mapping that out, right? What are all the what are all the concepts and techniques and skills that should be covered? How do those map and relate to each other? What are the prerequisites and so on? How should the training program flow? And I'm, as you can see, I broke these down into distinct modules. Uh, and the next step was actually developing the module content, which involved aggregating uh, high-quality resources, summarizing lesson notes, creating example exercises and, and, and demos. Uh, most of this lives within a large repository of markdown files that I interface with using a simple markdown editor. <laughs> it makes it very easy to maintain and update the content, which I do constantly as I come across new resources. Um, and at present, uh, I have over 400 modules here, uh, all of which I have not delivered in training, but I hope to one day. <laughs> Um, when delivering the training modules, the actual lessons, uh, I began recording these so that we could build a library of content to scale training, right? So we have pre-recorded training videos. Should we bring in new trainees? They can, hopefully the material hasn't changed in that time. You know, sometimes I do look back and I'm like, ah, oh, I wish I did that a little bit better or, or changed it around. But nevertheless, I think that, you know, some of the content, at least there's kind of some level of timeliness to it. Um, and so especially when it comes to, um, to procedural lessons, not only is it helpful for, uh, for training new candidates, but, uh, I also found that a lot of trainees were going back and looking at some of the video content, right? They'd seen it one time, they couldn't remember how to use maybe a specific tool or technique, and they would go back and look at the training library, uh, which was great, right? It was a great use for it. Um, but uh, often they were only interested in really specific elements, and so we have like videos that sometimes would span hours, and they're like, oh, I just want to know how to set up this tool, I don't need to know the background of HTTP. And um, so uh, realizing that there was a kind of a lack of content that I was making and, and also in the industry for that kind of quick, here's how you do this, here's how you get set up. Um, I also created a YouTube channel for this purpose, uh, and naturally I'm going to reference it at the end of the talk if you're interested. <laughs> um, so uh, as I mentioned, you know, we started hiring uh, cohorts of, of novice testers, and we started training them through the training program. And the next challenge after this uh, was answering the question, you know, when is a tester ready to conduct an actual engagement for a client? Uh, and this was the approach that we tried. So what we did was had essentially a final graduation exercise. And that exercise was using our processes and methodology and reporting mechanisms to do an engagement as if it were real against OWASP Juice Shop, right? The, the famous OWASP Juice Shop. And um, I think this was actually a reasonable ideal, or sorry, a reasonable idea. But uh, in practice, I would actually consider this approach a failure for a few reasons, which of course I'm going to talk about. Number one, the scope of the issues in JuShop is very large. So it takes actually an enormous effort to test and report against it, even compared to standard engagements. Um, and so 
uh, as trainees were, were going through it and, and learning through the process, it also required you know, many uh, iterations of reviews and feedbacks. And it was kind of an endless cycle of like they would do some testing, they would want some feedback. So we go through the reports, we find issues, we correct it, we update. It was a great learning process, but it, it never ended, right? It was a never ending process. Uh, ultimately, the reports never got completed. And uh, I bet my team is laughing watching this now because uh, <laughs> they worked, they put a lot of effort into those reports and I hope it was a valuable exercise, but the reports did not get finished. So, you know, while trainees learned a lot through this, uh, through this process and I think they did become ready for testing through it, um, it's not a very refined assessment and it doesn't let us easily provide like pass fail conditions um, and, and especially not related to specific skills or procedures either. Uh, so it, it was also hard to identify what uh, the gaps were in training, right? What should we focus on from this? Um, and, you know, as, as big as Juice Shop is, it also doesn't have every issue that we might want to assess. And, um, and I think also just this type of assessment, you know, approaching it by the vulnerabilities and reporting of those doesn't necessarily focus on core skills, right? Focusing on vulnerabilities rather than what, what are the procedures that they're taking to find these vulnerabilities, which I, I think are very interesting. Once we graduate testers, um, and they're kind of released into the wild and, and they're doing tests, our kind of de facto standard for providing ongoing feedback is really through the technical review process, which I think has, has got to be a standard in the industry, right, for providing ongoing feedback. You have a more experienced tester, review the report, find gaps, issues, and so on. Um, but um, our, our primary source of technical feedback, I think, really was quite limited in this way. Um, so consider... Consider the technical review where, you know, a senior tester provides a review of completed report findings. That goes into uh, a document somewhere. And from a management perspective, there were two major issues. The first was that I had no insight, uh, how, into how reviews were going unless I went to open them up, like parse through the reviews. And like, that's an enormous effort from a management point of view. Um, and, uh, you know, the other issue is that we weren't, uh, we, we weren't capturing a lot of information that could help us uh, gather like higher level and like identify higher level trends to provide really useful feedback. Like what are the persistent mistakes that people are making? Where do they need it, like to focus their, their further development on? Um, and so what we did was came up with a system to not just leave uh, feedback for the tester uh, in the report, but also a survey. So uh, technical reviewers would go and fill out a survey indicating uh, some context around the test, what they liked, what they think needs improvements, providing a score on the writing quality and the technical quality, uh, other information that can be used to look long term at how our testers are doing and provide really, I think, more valuable feedback. And this has been a valuable approach. Uh, of course, the other major problem that technical reviews uh, can't do is, you know, they're not really sensitive to catching major errors. It, like the biggest error in security testing, which is missing a finding, right? If a finding is just absent from a report, there's no good control for that. I think we simply don't have that in the industry. Um, so uh, I already introduced my first form, and I make uh, a lot of use of forms, right? Uh, getting feedback from my team is, is very important. Uh, so I use Microsoft Forms to survey the team frequently. Uh, and I definitely recommend some type of practice of, of surveys like this, especially for remote teams. So this is kind of my one remote uh, management recommendation. Uh, use surveys. Get the, the feedback of your team on initiatives, how they're doing, and so on. I mean, obviously, it doesn't replace one-to-one -one meetings. But uh, for certain types of information gathering, I think surveys are, are super Super helpful. Uh, I still have some kind of bad habits that don't work in remote uh, environments. You know, one of those is like in either, you know, team chats or in meetings. I'll be like, hey, so what does everyone think about this? And, you know, it's not, no one is compelled to answer that. Uh, and so no one ever does, right? It's different than when you're sitting in a room with someone, and you're like, hey, what do you think about that? It's a lot easier to look at people, see what, you know, how they're feeling, whether they have something to contribute. It's harder to do in uh, a remote environment. And so there's some adjustments that need to be made. And I'm, I'm still trying to adjust to it. Uh, and surveys are, I think, one of the great ways to actually accomplish that. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that I don't receive answers to those things because my team ignores me. <laughs> I think um, it, it's just really easy. You know, when you see something like that posted or you see someone ask something, it's assumed that it, it's easy to assume that the question is better answered, I think, by someone else. So, so as a result, no one ever answers questions. Or, or feedback when it's not directed, at least in a remote environment. Um, here are some results from another survey. Again, I use surveys all the time. This is for another initiative that, uh, as you can maybe see by the really tiny font on the slide, uh, I found that this has gone uh, very well. Everyone likes doing this. So I mentioned non-technical skills. 
Uh, when we're talking about non-technical skills, a lot of it really has to do with engagement management, communicating with clients. You know, we have clients who come back to us and they'll push back on findings. They'll uh, provide, you know, they'll give us really interesting questions. And uh, I realized it's, we didn't really have dedicated training to prepare our security testers for this, right? To communicate their findings, to engage with clients. Uh, and so I conceive of what we call the client den, where I act as the client. They get some reports together. We go around the circle and I essentially grill them on it. And uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, everyone likes it, at least from the survey results. Checklists. So checklists, of course, are an important uh, system component in the engagement lifecycle. Uh, again, the value of checklists is something well documented in like in fields like aviation and surgery. Um, but you know, there's also evidence that checklists get ignored, uh, and that does result in errors or omissions. And again, there's more data coming out of surgery or uh, that exists in the surgical world that shows. Um, you know, compliance is very important in using a checklist to avert errors. So we have both a procedural and a vulnerability checklist, essentially, and they can be somewhat burdensome to complete. Like, I feel burdened. I'm going through a test. I'm like, I wrote a lot of this. I know this stuff. <laughs> I, I'm ignoring the checklist. I'm bad for it. Um, it's Compliance is hard with checklists, right? Uh, we don't want to complete it when we feel like we know what we're doing. Um, so uh, we, we've undertaken an effort to try and develop it in a more dynamic way such that the checklist is constructed very specifically for a given engagement matched to its scope and methodology. Uh, and right now, unfortunately, to achieve this, we use Excel macros, but we're building a more dynamic system that will be coming soon. Um, and from a systems perspective, you know, one thing that is also very important is the template content and the, the way that you interact with reporting systems. So, um, you know, when I've seen template content from other firms, uh, and this is one thing I think we do very well, right? I, I often think, um, you know, not a lot of love has gone into this template content. Um, but we really prioritize building high quality, in-depth content for our reports. Um, because ultimately our reports are the final product. Um, you know, but sometimes we also have a tendency to make these overly complex or verbose. It's kind of very easy to do that, trying to capture all the situations, put them in one big consolidated finding. Uh, and this is an old example. Uh, we don't report like that anymore. Um, uh, but this was a table, uh, a part of, as part of a finding for reporting cross-origin resource sharing issues. Uh, and if you're a novice tester, like, there's a lot of content to navigate here. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, if you're reporting a really simple configuration, it's really prone to errors, like going through this, determining what should be included, what should be excluded, what kind of risk rating do you assign this. Um, and, you know, testers who um, make errors reporting this finding are committing an act of error, but from a systems perspective, the poor construction and guidance of the template content is essentially a latent error that predisposes testers to make those mistakes. So we apply this thinking to our efforts and have been making a strong effort to deconstruct complex findings and make sure that there are clear decision trees and guidance for actually you know, interacting with findings from uh, an engagement. Uh, another project that I bring up just because it's an interesting example of a failure and, um, you know, I, I attribute this to, to myself as well, not thinking this through, but a project I thought would be really valuable, um, is, uh, coming up with a findings archive, right? You have a, uh, an archive of anonymized findings. You can search through that. Trainees can reference findings. It didn't work. It, it didn't work because there was no incentive to contribute. And I'm guilty of this as well, right? You get busy with other things and no one contributes to the findings archive. It doesn't get used. Uh, you really need to think about in incentives in the system. Uh, this is another failed initiative, research seminar. I thought, this is a great idea. I'm going to post a lot of uh, great content that I, you know, I'd like us to read, and uh, I'd like someone to self-assign themselves to uh, you know, different you know, new tools, new techniques, whatever, do the reading, do the research, and present it at our regular meetings. And actually, this worked great during training. You know, our trainees were really into it, and then they get into testing, right? And they're busy with billable work, and it just is abandoned completely. Well, not completely, but almost completely, right? Because again, people are busy now doing their main like billable work and other things that interest them. There's no incentive to use a system like this. So as a system, I think that was a failure. So those are all the things that we've tried. And now to finish up, I would like to talk about what's under development and the future work. And if this is stuff that interests you, I really highly recommend you get in touch with me over some of these because this is stuff where especially I think uh, a community effort is warranted. So you had to know this was coming based on the talk. I would, would love to introduce the, um, you know, based on the surgical OSATs, the objective structured assessment of surgical testing skills or the OSAS. So we're in the process of constructing some proof of concept assessments to evaluate specific procedural testing skills. Uh, and notably, you know, this approach is very different from CTF-based assessments, which asks the question, did you find the vulnerability? Uh, I think this approach is, you know, still useful, like CTFs have a value, but with the approach here, we're asking the question, did you demonstrate mastery of the procedures and tools and skills required to find those vulnerabilities? And let's just give us, give very specific feedback relating to process. Um, 
which uh, is great. And this is kind of going to lead into the next evolution of our training curriculum, where these assessments will now become required parts of different training modules. So we take a module, we ask, what are the required training components? What are the prerequisites? Um, we can even map it to existing you know, OWASP standards. So look at the, at the ASVS, for example, right? We can look at how do we prepare testers for testing the requirements for the ASVS, and we can simply map that into the curriculum. Of course, this wouldn't be complete without a non-technical skills assessment. So here is the non-technical skills for security specialists. But uh, this one, I would say, is more in development, especially in terms of um, especially in terms of evaluating this. Right with the OSASs, the idea is we watch a very simple exercise with a very specific purpose. Um, with this, you know, a lot of these skills are really only performed over the course of an engagement, and engagements span you know one two weeks. You can't have someone observe all like client communication and calls and little things that people do during engagement. So I'm thinking about it, right? It's, it's a first start. Um, and, and finally, there's one system level control in surgery and aviation that I've not touched on adapting in security testing. Uh, and I'm very interested in this idea of black boxes, not black boxes as we think of them, like there's some system that, you know, we don't know how it works, we're, you're trying to reverse engineer it, but a black box in terms of this device that captures data from uh, engagement, so it lets us make inferences about it. Uh, and we already have tools like Burp Suite, for example, or Zap, that capture a substantial amount of testing data, but I think there's a lot more potential in using this data to understand and evaluate engagements, to look at uh, coverage, to see how testers are interacting with tools, how they're testing day to day. There's a lot of potential here, so uh, I hope that one day, you know, this alone can become a spin-off talk, but it's not there yet. All right, and that's it. So. Uh, that concludes the content of my talk. Here's the self-promotion. Uh, as I mentioned, I publish tra uh, technical training content to YouTube, which I've been neglecting recently, unfortunately, but I will be returning soon. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, you can reach me by email or LinkedIn. Uh, and finally, I would like to announce that uh, I've decided to start a newsletter uh, focusing exclusively on application security and security testing teams as a newsletter enthusiast myself. Uh, my main motivation here is from watching a lot of other AppSec newsletters just that I've long subscribed to just absolutely deteriorate and devolve, <laughs> largely in the AI and LLM directions, and kind of lose the focus on application security. So um, I think that uh, this might also be the first newsletter that will have insights on security testing team management. Might. I haven't seen another one. Um, and finally, uh, my company recently finally created a public GitHub account, and we will likely be publishing relevant project content here, like some of the stuff I've discussed today. Um, but uh, we haven't yet. But if you follow me, if you connect with me, I'll let you know when that comes up. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. We have uh, some time for a Q&A. And if you uh, yeah. Yes, hi. Thank you for your talk. I'm a pen tester myself. And in my team, we um, started to write a baseline. It's a little bit similar to your... Um, to your uh, library of content and one problem that we found was that we write a lot of uh, du uh, duplicate content because mm -hmm. you can find it on the web as well with resources that are much more updated, thorough and so on. And we decided for us to limit our baseline to things that we want to do different in our team or where we want to have a common position. And we skipped all the, um, yeah, the, the explanation of the actual vulnerability. But you decided to um, explain it. Why? Explain? How, how do you mean? You decided to explain vulnerabilities with a video, with text, and everything. Although um, your uh, junior employees could find that online. Oh right, the producing the content that otherwise would be. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, that makes sense. Um, I mean, the the idea is um, I'm showing them the process that we take and kind of consolidating all of that information, right? So it's you can. A, a problem with a lot of online resources is that. Um, I would consider even some of the better ones are kind of missing some of the things that we do procedurally, uh, how we approach testing, uh, how also especially how we report testing, the tools that we use. Uh, and so by putting things together into like video training, um, first of all, I think that it's a lot easier to deliver that to our own trainees when like they're joining the call. Like most of them are not watching just the videos on their own. They're joining a call. We're doing it live. They're asking questions, right? I'm helping them understand the concepts. So there's a more interactive element to it, but there's also a lot more uh, consolidation of uh, the information and gearing it towards our specific processes and, and how we approach it. So um, you're right that in terms of there is still, nevertheless, a lot of duplication of effort, unfortunately. And I think especially one of the big areas of duplication of effort is in you and I independently creating 
curriculum content, right? <laughs> and uh, that's maybe a problem that we can solve uh, as an industry through you know, OWASP or, or other organizations. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your talk. I think I had one experience where we had some black box installed because we didn't trust the pen testers we were using anymore. We used an external party, but we didn't trust them. They were not giving any results. And effectively, we saw at one application, they tested the first page, but didn't test all the rest. So we went into the logs and saw, we confronted the company with it. And I think that's a good example of the black box that, that you're also presenting. So I think it's needed for some companies to... Yeah, I'd, I, and I've seen that practice before, right? And it's because if you're, there's not much else you can do it, if you're hiring a vendor to do testing to evaluate, you know, what they've, what they've done than that, right? Uh, unless we have, uh, you know, some clients will work with them and we can deliver a BERT project as well so they can kind of inspect, you know, what we've done. But even then, I, I think there's not really a standardized process to identify coverage. And uh, what I really like to do with BERP is come up with some tool that can, at a very high level, give you the coverage of, of what was tested and, and to what depth. And I think that's a non-trivial, perhaps like a completely unanswerable question, but I still want to pursue it. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Yeah, I um, really appreciate the the structure the and the, the guidance. I'd, I'd love to pick your brain after after this. And well, My brain is ready. Uh, always good to see some from, from uh, Canada over here. Um, so I think one of the most important things that I take away and keep echoing is one of your first points where effectively you, you can train, you feel like you can train anyone to do this, right? Anyone can be a pen tester. But what are you doing or what are you looking for in terms of skills or where are you looking to find people to bring them in to the industry rather than, you know, some of the more traditional backgrounds? So like you're saying, if you're trying to diversify, again, this is a great opportunity to diversify the, the people that we bring into the industry and give opportunity. Like what are you doing in that area to attract the people in? So I know it's sort of tangent on the topic, but. No, it's, it's a great yeah. question. Um, I, I think my unfortunate answer is I don't have full visibility to that because we actually have a dedicated recruiter who does uh, a great job at that kind of first layer of, of finding and, and filtering candidates. So the kind of first stage that they go through uh, and how we identify candidates, I don't see a lot of that, uh, with some exceptions, right? Some exceptions. Um, but in, in terms of, yeah, what are the other things that we're doing when we're hiring someone who's a complete novice? Well, you know, we're, we're not just looking for anyone, obviously, right? We're looking for the passion and interest in doing it. We need to make sure that from a technical point of view, this is someone who is very technically literate. Like I would consider that a prerequisite, being able to work with operating systems and complex tools and that sort of thing. I don't really care to what capacity, whether they've uh, had IT experience, whether they are a developer, or maybe they're just a tinkerer, right? And I think people who have hobbies and people who tinker with things, those are always great candidates, right? It's, it's someone who's passionate about something, they're willing to dive into the weeds of something, learn it and master it. I think that's a great attribute to look for. And historically, that's what we've looked for, right? It's basically, like, what are your hobbies? And if someone's like, I don't really have anything, I watch TV, I guess. And you know, that's not, that's not a no, but it's, uh, it, it's something that, that makes it challenging to decipher whether I think they, they have the capability to really dive in and get, be committed to security testing. Hello. Uh, thanks for the talk and sharing your work. Hey, thanks uh, for coming. Uh, I wanted to ask you something, but uh, I don't. I, I hope it's not out of scope. It's maybe more more about maintaining a good uh, penetration team. Uh, what's I wanted to to have your opinion on on having an X amount of time per week or per month or. Uh, to give to collaborators or to pen testers for research, for uh, education, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and that's a great question. And I think it's something that we actually haven't fully solved. And I, I've seen it done differently at, at different organizations, right? Some organizations, it's like you have a set amount of days that you can book over the year or whatever. Some have like some percentage that you regularly have. Uh, we haven't really formalized a perfect structure for this. We kind of go with the flows of like engagements, right? So we have busy periods and we have less busy periods. And basically, you know, we, we hope that we have enough <laughs> non-busy periods to, to do that kind of work, uh, with some exceptions, right? If someone's going for something specific, if they have a specific like training objective, they want to do a cert certification or whatever, then, you know, we'll go to our project management team and we'll book that time for them. But right now it's kind of, yeah, we don't have a formal process for it. And it's been something I've been thinking about. Um, it hasn't been a major issue not having a formal process, but yeah, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's all ad hoc, really. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and last question. 
Uh, it's it's great that you as a manager of a boutique security firm are, are making sure that these things work very well, that people are doing a very good job. Uh, do you think that regulations coming out these days, like the like the CRA in Europe, will help us move towards generally a more professionalized model? Uh, you know, can we can we build standards of evaluation and following proper procedures? to make sure that you know the puppy mills have to upgrade themselves to to actually do a good job? So I want to say I hope so. Um, in Canada, at least, we're not even close. We're, I feel like we're very bar, far behind in Canada. Um, but uh, I think it's worth looking at how other fields have professionalized. And surgery is another great example, right? And surgery is a little bit different structurally because surgery has a lot more public interest, right? People want to get safe surgeries. So in the kind of early days, you know, towards... The, the first efforts of professionalization in surgery, there was a lot of public interest in surgeons being better. There's not a lot of public interest in application security testers being better, right? So we don't have that external force, but nevertheless, a lot of the driving force was internal to the profession, right? It's the creation of working groups collaborating across the industry to determine what should the standards be. You know, we are the professionals doing this. Um, I, I would really much like not like us to outsource it to People beyond the community. I think application security professionals as an industry need to get together and determine what the standards are and, and hopefully influence the regulation around that. And I don't think we've done uh, a great job at that. And I'm obviously I'm speaking as someone who's also guilty of not putting any effort into that. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for participating. And thanks, Ryan, for this positive energy. Yeah. And break, uh, you can serve yourself. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>